some of the base some of the basics. Um, as many of you know, uh, daughter is an obligate parasite, and it will wrap around its host, and it will actually make physical attachments into the vascular system. And I'll show you some pictures of this. What makes daughter so successful as a as an organism and so problematic as a pest is the fact that it is a very prolific seed producer. And there's some notations that one plant can produce more than 16,000 seeds, which is just an incredible amount of uh, of seeds going into the seed bank each year. And once it becomes established, it has a tremendous growth potential as a stem and has been documented to grow about three inches in a day. Uh, also, what makes it very problematic uh, in agricultural systems is the fact that it has a very broad host range. Uh, it can attach to uh, plants such as tomatoes and carrots and trees and grasses and many other, many other plants that are, are present within a production system. The seeds are incredibly long-lived. As you see there, they can actually survive going through an animal's intestines and still come out and be able to germinate. One of the biggest problems with cranberries is the fact that the seeds are born in capsules that can float. And this is how they are dispersed within the cranberry system is during harvest. Uh, the seeds are produced in late August, early September. When we come through and we harvest, we knock all the seed capsules off of the uh, host, and then we can distribute them in our flood water. So uh, the organism is very well set up to take advantage of some of the cultural practices that we use. Um, some people uh, might think that daughter does not have any chlorophyll, but actually newly emerged seedlings may actually contain a little bit of chlorophyll, and that does provide them with some energy resources to get going uh, prior to finding a host. And also what makes it tough is that uh, the detached stems, if you just go and pull stems off of a host plant, these stems can regenerate. And so this, this also makes it very difficult to manage. I wanted to show you some pictures of the Hostoria, uh, which is very characteristic of parasitic plants. And it is, it is the way that daughter gets into the host plant and extracts the, the carbohydrates and the, the water from the xylem and the phloem. And this is what also makes it um, so successful. So let's show a picture here. OK, so if we look here, let me get this little arrow, see if this works. OK, so here we see a picture of the daughter stem, which is kind of like this yellowish tissue right here. Here's the plant's epidermis, kind of colored red. And here you can see how the hostorium is actually penetrated through the epidermis, through the, the secondary xylem, and is going right into the vascular tissues. So it actually has like a penetration peg. And here again is another photo. This is the daughter stem that's going around the host plant right here. And here's about seven different hostoria that are impregnating itself into the host plant, going right into the vascular tissues. So it just gives you an idea of, of how this plant operates and what makes it so difficult to control. Many of you are familiar, this is just a bird's eye view of a, a pretty nice infestation of daughter uh, on a cranberry field. And up close, this actual piece of daughter, pieces of daughter here have been treated with Callisto, which is a, a bleaching herbicide. So that's why some of these strands do look white here. Uh, but by and large, you're going to have them look as yellow or orange strands. And here are the very small white flowers that are very typical of daughter as well. So thinking about doing some control of daughter and cranberries, what's interesting is that it really is an excellent uh, example of using integrated management to control a particular pest. But the downside of that is it's that because no one particular control method works perfectly well. So we must use many different approaches to trying to control daughter in any particular year. By and large, the biggest thing <coughs> is prevention. To keep it off your farm at all costs initially, that's the best thing to do. 
We'll talk more about each of these options uh, as we go through the presentation, but looking at pre-emergence and post-emergence herbicide use, using short floods, sanding, actually removing uh, daughter by hand, and using raking. We did a survey a couple of years ago um, and polled our growers just to see what were some of their biggest obstacles to control. And um, this is, you know, li what they either listed as number one is in the yellow bar or number n as number one and two together are in the blue bars. And you could see that the small application window was what most growers cited as their biggest obstacle to control. And that's, we'll talk more about that, and that has a lot to do with the biology of this particular parasite. Certainly herbicide cost is a consideration. When to apply, that kind of fits in with the small application window as well. And what were some of the practices that were used? Uh, a couple years ago, we actually did have a Section 18 to be able to use CURB, uh, which provided excellent control for us. We no longer have that. Uh, but Casseron was very popular. We still can use it. And what's really interesting is that hand pulling and raking were very commonly used, were, you know, among the, the top five for sure of what growers would use to try to manage pests. And as you'll see in the next slide, these were rated as being poor. I mean, 62% of the growers rated uh, raking as being poor and hand pulling, being poor control, but still a lot of time and effort is, uh, is being spent with these strategies, even though uh, they don't provide the kind of control that we'd like to see. And that just is a testament to w how capable of a, of a weed pest daughter is. So let's look at some of the options that we have. I kind of put these in chronological order as we go through the year. Uh, so thinking about sanding, which typically tends to be a winter, spring uh, practice that we do. Uh, we did a study several years ago, about 10 years ago now, where we buried daughter seeds under different depths of sand because uh, growers will typically put out about a half an inch to an inch of sand and I know these are in centimeters but this is about a half an inch to an inch of sand when they do this cultural practice and we wanted to see what the impact would be and we did this study twice and you can see here that we need to get to about an inch before we start seeing the number of emerged seedlings uh, going down significantly. We did see um, in the second study there was a statistical difference between zero and a half an inch, but again we saw a very nice reduction at an inch of sand. So that's primarily what we've been recommending is if you want to see any suppression of daughter seedlings with sanding you need to go with about an inch. So the other key with sanding is that there was some work that was done by uh, Laura Hunsberger as part of her master's thesis um, looking at the uniformity of sanding. And it turns out that our, when we put sand out on cranberry bogs, it does tend to be very non-uniform. So this could be the reason that some growers, even though they try doing sanding for daughter control, it doesn't always work because sometimes you're not getting out the kind of uh, depth of sand that you would want. And I also made this note here of consider the implications of sanding when you use herbicides. And that's primarily uh, thinking about caron, that you don't want to put casseron down first and then sand on top of it because um, you can definitely get some vine injury when you do things like that. So just to keep those in mind. And occasionally I just wanted to note that in this presentation, if there are some publications associated with the recommendations, I did uh, note those in the bottom of the slide, so if you wanted to go read the research articles, you could do that. Scouting is another process that we do, and this would normally happen around late April, early May for us in, in Massachusetts. And we look for first seedling emergence as a biofix to help us time some of our other application, our other management methods, such as the application of herbicides or short floods. And I'll talk more about those. Um, we look in warm spots or those harvest areas on the side of the bog where you pull your, f your fruit off. That's a lot of times where seed pods tend to be deposited and you can have different areas on the bog where you can try and find these very small seedlings. 
it is quite challenging to look for these seedlings and as you can see uh, these seedlings here that are pictured here are probably about one to two days old and they're very very small and just to give you an idea of what you're trying to find out on the bog here's a dime and here are those small seedlings that I just showed you and here is a seedling that's probably about maybe three days old or four days old. So you really have to pull apart the vines and really get down on your hands and knees to try to find these in the canopy. And that's why growers tend to, to go for these uh, the bare areas or the places where they pull off their fruit as, uh, as more likely scouting areas to find seedlings. Well, let's look at some of the data that we've collected over about the past 12 years uh, looking at the germination patterns of dodder and this will tie into the, the whole scouting and, and how we try to uh, figure out when to apply our, our management strategies of either herbicides or floods or something like that. We started a study where we, we use simulated where we, we build our own little bogs in these five gallon pails and we started one in 1997 and one in 1998 where we just dumped daughter seed into these buckets and after that we added no more and we just went every year and we counted uh, how many seedlings we got over the entire season to try to see what the germination patterns were. So these buckets are actually still out on the bog and here we are in 2009 and they're still uh, having seedlings germinating which gives you an idea of the longevity of daughter seeds that are thrown out into the farm. What I want to show you here on this particular graph, so here's study one, which we started in 97, study two, which happened in 98. They were basically the same, except we had fewer seeds um, in study two uh, than we did in study one. But basically, the pattern is what we really want to look at here. In the first year that we put the seeds in, we had the highest germination rate. And then after that, basically we had a bump here in study one, but basically the germination declines over time. Okay, and these numbers here just represent uh, this, this number here around a 5,000 for the mean number of germinations per container is about 8% of the total number of seeds that we put in there. So we put a lot of seeds in. The second study, as I mentioned, we put much fewer seeds in but we still got about the same number but that's why you have a higher percentage there but just just look at how you know we have a very robust germination the first year and then it declines over time and so if we take um, if we try to imagine this the germination pattern that we've had over say a period of eight years and that's what we have represented over here with generation one if you just imagine that being the first seeds so like say in, in 2009 seeds were produced and we think of generation one as being the seeds that are going to come out in 2010 these would be the seeds in 2011 2012 and so on what we can see here is that in the first year again we have a very robust definitive peak of when seedlings germinate and then it crashes back down. The other important thing to see on this graph is the fact that here are all these generations of seeds that have been out on the bog and they're still germinating at a, at a low level but they're also germinating later and later into the year. And so what I have here on the axis is the Julian date, which just made it easier for us to try to work with the year-by-year the -year data. But I've put in the monthly approximations here so you can see. So here about is when late April is, which is when we are scouting for daughter seedlings. Here is our peak, which occurs probably early May. This black line here shows when 50% of the, of the population has germinated. This little black line here shows when 90% of the population has germinated. So we typically put on our Casseron applications here in mid-May. So you can see that we've missed the peak and this and Casseron operates as a pre-emergence and we have, we're putting on our herbicide applications too late in this particular situation. So that's one problem which might explain why we don't see the kind of response with Casseron that we would hope to see. 
The other take home with this graph is the fact that we have all these seedlings that are still germinating way out into June into mi the middle of June that can potentially be causing infestations. So I know, I know that there's a lot of information here and I'd be happy to, to try to talk with people at a later date with this, but I just wanted to try to give you um, a perspective on why daughter can be so problematic. So the, the real things to consider here is that the first germinating seedlings are going to happen when you're going to be scouting for these, going to happen in early April, about 50% the population's going to germinate and that most recently produced ger generation is going to germinate by in early May. 90% is going to germinate by about the middle of May. And you have to consider this viability issue, the longevity of daughter seeds is very key. So by the fact that we have a delayed first and peak germination occurring over time with these generations, we end up having this overlapping generation phenomenon which prolongs the period of time that seedlings are emerging. And this is what makes uh, control so difficult. So we, we can't rely just on pre-emergence. We must also look at post-emergence. Another project that we did was looking at flooding for a non-chemical option. Again, these timings would be around uh, the same as uh, the herbicide applications for Casseron. And again, just to, to show you what we did here, we did demonstration style um, bog by bog comparisons. So, you know, this is an example of, of one of our sites where we flooded one bog and did not flood the other one. And here's just the dike road in between. So we had about seven different paired sites and we flooded this particular grouping here. We flooded them all for 36 hours in the middle of May or so. And we went out and measured dry stem weight and you could see where we flooded and non-flooded. So here's the flooded site. We had significantly less daughter biomass being produced in these three different sites. Now our results were not consistent because again here we had three different sites noted by their numbers three seven and two where we actually ended up having more daughter biomass in the flooded area than in the non-flooded area in two of the sites and no difference in one of the sites now we got to the point where we were wondering if we would have had um, even greater daughter in this flooded area if we hadn't flooded at all because when we looked at the historical infestation of the daughter we found that this particular bog had a very very high infestation so maybe we would have produced 30 or 40 grams of stem mass if we hadn't flooded but we really couldn't answer that question with this particular study so the biggest take home that happened with this is that the growers actually really liked using this particular flooding practice because they felt that it really worked for them so even though it didn't work so well or consistently in our daughter in our demonstration studies, uh, many growers have embraced this and they've really felt that it's helped to give them another option. We there's certainly more questions that remain. We have followed the, these studies up with some incubator studies. We really couldn't show any difference between flooding between uh, 24 and 48 hours, but it does seem that the further you get from first seedling emergence, the better control you get. So if your first seedling emerges in early April, if you tend to flood more like early May to the middle of May, you seem to get better control. But we still have a lot of work to do here. And, uh, and I'm just going to move on just for time. So Casseron use is certainly a, a good pre-emergence options that we have. Again, timing is very critical, as I pointed out, in the, uh, with the whole pattern of germination with daughter. We typically use between um, 30 and 60 pounds per acre. Casseron volatilizes very quickly, so it's very important that you water it in immediately. And certainly one of the concerns that we have is that the time when we're applying Casseron, we're also protecting for frost injury. And if you have to run your systems for, you know, several nights of eight hours, you're likely to reduce the efficacy of Casseron to control daughter. 
You want to watch in the spring if your temperatures exceed 60 degrees because you're going to lose uh, herbicide to, to the air to, uh, to when it volatilizes. As I mentioned before, sanding after applying can cause injury. And we typically see some stress with casserun, and th this exhibits itself as, ca as a, what we call yellow vine syndrome. We did a trial this year where we looked at several varieties and different timings to see if we could actually go later in the year with a low timing to try to go in early to mid-June to try to get some of those later emerging populations and still get some good control. So we did four varieties, weekly applications, and two different rates. So it turns out that there definitely was a varietal response. Um, we had the Ben Lears look particularly sensitive, with Stevens being the least sensitive. And there was also seemed to be a weak response, and notably right here at week four, which corresponds to early June, which would be about jewel stage for most of those varieties, is when we had the highest injury rating. And interestingly, as we got Later into June, till about the 15s or 20s of June, we started seeing lower injury, which kind of surprised us. So this gives you an idea. This slide shows um, the Ben Lear, the kind of injury that we saw. This is classic yellow vine syndrome, kind of getting this Christmas tree appearance uh, in the middle of the leaves. And you can see it right here. This is very, very severe injury. The howls, not so much. So thinking now, going to post-emergence options, we did some additional work look, thinking about Callisto. And we had several different treatments that we did, uh, multiple rates, either before daughter flowered, uh, applying once, or doing two applications, making the first application before flowering, which is what this is, and then applying two to three weeks later. And then we also just did a single application after flowering. And what we found pretty much is that, you know, if you look at day 46 here, this is looking at the injury rating to daughter. So pretty much any of the applications that we did before flowering were much more injurious than certainly the untreated and those that we did after flowering. So timing is important when you're going after daughter with Callisto. We've actually repeated this whole study uh, this year, but we're still processing all the data. We all also went through and looked at the number of healthy seeds that we had. And, and here again, you can see we had over 200 healthy seeds produced with untreated, and this number went down significantly with 8 ounces and 4 ounces, 2 applications, and 1 application of 8 ounces as well. So we were definitely having an impact on daughter seed production. So we were really excited about the potential of being able to use Callisto as a nice post-emergence option, but I'll certainly feel a lot better about making that recommendation uh, once we get the second year worth of data. Another option to go post is using a mechanical rake. Um, this was some work again done by Laura Huntsberger as part of her master's thesis where she looked at multiple farms. So again here the strands were broken but the hostoria were not removed so the, there were some stem regeneration concerns. Her data showed that removing daughter once certainly reduced cover by three quarters, by 74, 75 percent. There was no additional benefit to raking more than once. And the yield loss that she saw was mostly due to daughter. But certainly if you're out there doing some very heavy raking, you can just knock fruit off and really negate any kind of benefit that you might see otherwise. So I'm going to just click through these data here just for the sake of time, but I pretty much have captured it. 
um, just to go on and allow some time for questions. We did do two years of testing in both Wisconsin and, and Massachusetts looking at Smolder, which was a commercially available biocontrol product made from Alton area, but unfortunately it seemed to be very non-effective. Um, we tried it many different ways with many different applications. Uh, but we were just not able to get this product to work in the field. Uh, and there is some other products out there, and um, they are concentrated on Kalatotricum, and these do look to be more promising, and we hope to be able to do some additional research on those. Um, I do see that there was a question on the timing of the flooding. I apologize that I didn't, get, didn't see that earlier. Um, the flooding tends to be... Uh, around the middle of May, but we still need to do m more research on this to find out when the best timing is. So again, at this point, I would look for when the seedlings are first germinating and then try to go about four weeks after that. A lot of times, daughter floods are coincide with when growers want to flood for black-headed fireworm. So depending on their water resources, uh, this may determine uh, whether they could do sh two short-term floods or if they just combine them and try to get the best that they can with the, for the two different pests. I'm almost through, so I, I think I'm going to wait and just handle the couple of questions um, at the end. I have a graduate student right now that's looking at flame cultivation for daughter control. Um, interestingly, it seems that wherever we f use these flame cultivators, we seem to have our daughter populations um, affected by Calatotricum. Um, so we weren't able to really assess the impact of flame cultivating on daughter, but we have certainly generated another research question to see if the injury caused by uh, the, the heat is making the daughter more susceptible to Calatotricum um, because we weren't even able, and there were like no seeds produced in these plots that were treated, but it wasn't due to the flame cultivation, it was due to um, the fungus coming in, which was very interesting. So just as a, a take-home checklist, out of this at the end, this, this gives the whole host of things that we can think of doing for daughter control just to, to present it to you all on, on one slide, just uh, for your information. And as I mentioned, uh, some of our future projects, you know, we're going to try to continue to look for other herbicides, do more work on short floods, pursue this whole Calatotricum issue, uh, and in conjunction with flame cultivation, and see if these things work synergistically. We would really like to see if different varieties are more or less susceptible to daughter than others, and we don't really know. And we've also initiated some work looking at different plant growth regulators to see if they could uh, help abort uh, daughter seed production, which would go a long way to helping us manage this pest. So at that point, that's all I have. I hope I didn't run too long. And um, I see that there's one question, and, and I'd be happy to uh, entertain any other questions, if that's OK with you, Laura. That's great, Hillary. Yep. Thank you, and I love your final slide. Um, and my question was just about uh, not knowing a lot about cranberry cult culture and production. I'm just wondering if there are other weed problems that. Could oh, be there are absolutely. There's way. probably more than 80 different weed species that have been identified on cranberry bogs, and we we tend to rank them in four priority groupings uh, based on the ability to control them how quickly they spread, and how damaging they are to yield. And I would say our, our biggest ones besides daughter are the dewberries, the rubus species, poison ivy, yellow loosestrife, and the sawbriars, which are the smilax species. Those are probably our biggies. Yep, are there... Okay, thank you. Does anybody else have any uh, I realized that that was a lot... Um, I act no, it was great. And I actually have a couple of polls that I apologize for not posing to the group before your presentation. It may, might have helped um, you know the, the layout of the entire group that was listening. And I'm going to um, introduce those now before Eric is speaking. And so that will still give you folks a few more minutes to ask Hillary some questions. And um, let me just get a little bit of ideas. 
about the makeup of the this um, group. And so if you folks would just uh, answer these questions to the best of the ability, you can check more than one, depending upon what uh, your role with Berry Production is. And I was just going to mention, too, that you had listed the UMass Cranberry Station website um, as one of your uh, resources. And if folks go to the home page and click on the webmaster and send questions there, those actually come right to me. So if people, you know, afterwards want to try to follow up, uh, that's one way you can get in contact with me as well as my direct email. Okay, so I see Linda's asking if, if Dodder's native to Massachusetts or if it's introduced. Um, I believe it's native to this area. It's, it, Dodder is such a ubiquitous uh, plant that you can, you can find it in the, in the swamplands uh, growing just about anywhere. But as far as it being native to cranberry bogs, it probably was brought in from the, from the wetlands and from some of the uplands that surround the actual production areas. I do want to um, mention too, it looks like in my poll I made an error on the very final choice It says blueberry industry support. I really should just say berry industry support, meaning if you're a nurseryman or a, a salesperson, we'd love to find out that too. And it does look like we had about 21 people that has, have given us some feedback. Please don't be shy. Um, I, we'd love to hear from you. I also um, want to say one quick thing that... Uh, for those of you, there's a couple of names that I don't recognize on the attendee list, which means that perhaps you were forwarded the connection information, which is not a problem, except that we really need to keep track of who is attending and um, because we are going to be sending some evaluations out to you folks. Um, this is a fairly new uh, delivery system for information, and we are going to be really trying to evaluate the effectiveness of it, get your responses. So some surveys um, will be coming your way. I want, I really request that you're going to be um, uh, patient with them and try to answer them to the best of your, uh, your ability because that information will be very, very important to us as we use this um, webinar type format in the future. Um, okay, we've got somebody that's let me just see if I can make that poll a little bit larger so that the Geneva site can see. Yep. Um, and then okay. Eric, uh, um, as far as the other weeds, we, we're actually still finding out what Callisto does control, but it seems to do an excellent job on nut sedge, which is a, a cypira species. It seems to do um, a pretty good job on clover, narrow leaf goldenrod. Uh, growers have reported that it actually does weaken poison ivy. We've seen it impact our, uh, the sawbriars and the dewberries, so I don't know whether I would say that it actually controls them, but it certainly bleaches them out and, and stunts their growth. Um, so there's, there's many grasses that it controls as well, but certainly nutsedge is, is a good one that it does a great job on. So it looks like I've kind of lost my question ability to see, but that's okay. No, no, that's okay. Not a problem. Oh, I'm sorry. And I'll, I'll be staying I'll on for right the, you know, till for Eric's talk as well. So if, if there's other questions. But thank you all for, for listening. I see that there's a lot of blueberry growers, and I'm sorry that I didn't attend to more blueberry issues. Well, we had hoped, um, actually I thought that there were going to be some cranberry people on because we did have some folks um, register, and I'm not totally sure what happened there, but uh, fortunately this will be archived so that cranberry growers can get no problem, my this pleasure. information, Hillary, and I really appreciate it. It was fascinating. And now we're going to, great, we're going to close this um, and we'll get Eric Hansen introduced here. I also want to let folks know that you do have the ability, if you'd like to have the presentation <laughs> pod enlarged to fill your whole screen, you can do that. And let me get, um, there we go, there's Eric's picture. And um, I'm going to um, 
actually introduce uh, our next speaker is Dr. Eric Hansen. He is a professor and extension, extension specialist at Michigan State University. He focuses on applied questions relating to fruit production with an emphasis on berries and along with season extension and um, some fertility work, he also does weed control and cover cropping work. So it's wonderful to have you, Dr. Hansen, and um, I'm yeah, going thank to you. turn it I'm over. I'm real happy to be participating in this and thanks so much for organizing it, uh, Laura. Uh, I was asked to uh, cover blueberry weed uh, management, uh, so I'll cover some of the basics and uh, was also asked to talk about some things that might be a little bit newer and uh, I'll try to uh, try to do that as well. Uh, so uh, the chemical tools will we'll go through uh, pre-emergent and post-emergent uh, herbicides that are commonly used in blueberries, what they do, how to choose them and then some chemical uh, cultural approaches uh, as well including uh, mulch use, uh, cultivation and, and some other other things. Um, as you probably know if you grow blueberries they don't compete well with weeds. They're, they're a slow growing uh, plant and they're overrun with weeds uh, um, very uh, quickly. Uh, they don't fill their space um, and if you don't control the weeds when the bushes are small they may never uh, fill their space. And there are a number of uh, reasons for this. First they, they compete with the plants for water, uh, nutrients, and uh, light. Sometimes we don't think about the shading that uh, weeds, uh, tall weeds can uh, cause. They also disrupt uh, sprays and can promote uh, some diseases and insect pests. Uh, for example, um, uh, saf sassafras uh, uh, weeds in a blueberry uh, patch are a, a great magnet for Japanese beetles. So if you have uh, sassafras or grapevines in your blueberry patch, um, those will tend to attract uh, Japanese beetle into the patch as well. And then uh, some weeds uh, produce uh, fruit which uh, can actually get uh, intermixed with the harvested blueberries and adulterate the product which can be uh, particularly uh, concerning if it's a, a poisonous um, uh, fruit. So a lot of reasons for controlling weeds. I'd, I'd like to make the point though that um, you like any good thing you can overdo it. Uh, so here is a uh, um, what I'd consider a perfectly um, uh, managed uh, blueberry patch. So this this area uh, here has no weeds. This is uh, late in the summer. Um, it suggests to me that uh, this grower might have applied too much herbicide. Um, I'd like to see some annual weeds breaking through and covering the ground late in the season. Uh, late in the season blueberry uh, bushes will tolerate some competition from uh, weeds. It's not uh, that concerning. And this grower has also uh, cultivated and you're probably uh, aware that uh, repeated cultivation uh, diminishes the quality of, uh, of soils. So if he's doing this uh, without adding any organic matter, uh, eventually uh, that will reduce uh, the quality of the uh, um, the soil in that patch. So the point is, I, I guess, is that uh, you can overdo it. Um, by the end of the season, you would like to see some uh, low-growing uh, weeds establishing in your uh, uh, blueberry field. So our blueberry um, weed control recommendations are all um, uh, outlined each year on this uh, in this publication so it's updated each year and you can order that publication from this uh, this website and a lot of the information I'll talk about today is uh, in that uh, publication and I think it's a real valuable uh, publication for uh, for any commercial grower so we should talk about uh, pre-emergent herbicides which are applied generally before um, weeds emerge. They act through the soil to control 
germinating uh, seedlings and some established uh, uh, weeds. And then post-emergent herbicides are applied directly to weeds that are already present. There's an overlap of some of these. So I, I listed Callisto, uh, for example, which Hillary um, talked about as a pre-emergent herbicide, but it's also uh, applied post-emergent uh, to control weeds that are already uh, up and, and growing. So types of weeds, a uh, number of different uh, annual weeds. These are some of the common annual weeds in uh, Michigan blueberries. And I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, these if you grow blueberries. And you can probably add to, uh, add to this list. So those are the broadleaf, uh, some broadleaf weeds. The uh, pre-emergent herbicides, uh, we, we try to give um, in uh, E154 publication a indication of the relative uh, uh, suitability of different herbicides against different um, weeds. So here we're looking at some of uh, the broadleaf uh, annual weeds and the effectiveness of different pre-emergent herbicides. And you, you can see that they vary uh, substantially uh, depending on the, on the weed and the, um, the material. So for the broadleaf um, annual weeds, Casseron, for example, is pretty strong across the board. And, and we in Michigan generally think of uh, Carmex and, and Princep as being strong um, annual broadleaf weed uh, control materials. Now here are some ratings of the same herbicides for control of annual grasses. And, and things change somewhat here. So uh, Casseron is, is not so um, strong. <coughs> what seems to be uh, um, rated uh <coughs> most consistently uh, good against annual grasses is uh, Devernol. Uh, we think uh, Simbar, Solacam, and, and Surflan as all being good annual grass uh, materials. Uh, perennials. Uh, blueberries are a perennial plant and uh, as a result a lot of the most difficult weeds to control tend to also be uh, perennial uh, species. Uh, these are some that we think of as being uh, code red um, type of um, uh, weeds in Michigan blueberries in that they're um, uh, noxious enough and um, invasive enough to where you really should make a concerted effort to try to eliminate these uh, when you first see them so that they don't become established in your uh, in your blueberry patch and uh, these are common ones in, in Michigan and I'm sure you can add more uh, to this list so let's look at those same herbicides for their uh, relative effectiveness against these um, selective perennial weeds. Well, uh, Callisto, not particularly uh, good. Casseron provides uh, some level of control of uh, some of these. Uh, Sinbar provides uh, some level of control of uh, some of these. But you'll notice that none are rated with uh, uh, four stars for, or excellent control. So the, the point is that these pre-emergent materials provide some control of perennial weeds but not very good control. So uh, my point is that you should think about your pre-emergent program in the spring as a way of controlling the annual uh, weeds that are present and think about other ways of controlling uh, uh, some of these hard to control perennial weeds. So let's talk about annuals. Um, in Michigan, we can usually uh, provide um, summer long control of most annuals by using the appropriate uh, herbicide at the appropriate rate and at the appropriate time. Now in order to do that uh, you need to know uh, first the weeds that are present and um, I made a note of uh, what I think is the best uh, weed ID uh, book available is the Weeds of the Northeast out of Cornell University Press. Um, it's a um, wonderful publication if you want to identify weeds in your blueberry patch. We also have uh, um, quite a few of the 
more troublesome uh, weeds uh, um, listed on our um, web page at MSU, uh, www.blueberries.msu.edu. So you might want to take a look at that, uh, uh, that site as well. So for annual uh, weed uh, control then, um, generally this requires uh, application of a pre-emergent herbicide about the time that the weeds begin to emerge in the spring, so April or May, depending on uh, your location. In Michigan, we normally um, ban this in about a five foot wide strip beneath the uh, bushes. Uh, and then we try to maintain uh, some kind of a annual crop such as annual rye or a perennial sod between the rows. Uh, I wanted to um, make the point that uh, these labeled rates of uh, herbicides are for acre a per acre of treated surface area so if we're only treating half of this acre our actual amount of herbicide we're using will be half of the labeled rate. So let's uh, look a little more specifically at some uh, herbicide programs. Uh, first, considering uh, young plants. So these would be one and two year old plants. Uh, sometimes I think also uh, uh, you should consider uh, small plants or, or weak plants that uh, haven't been getting enough water, um, haven't been um, uh, taken care of properly. So they might be older than two years, but uh, uh, two years in, uh, in size. So here, these uh, plants are less uh, tolerant of some of the pre-emergent herbicides. So we normally think about the, the safer herbicide products, and th those might be Devernal and Gallery in surfland, so those could be applied in the spring. They're not as effective or long-lasting as some of the more effective uh, materials, but they're safer on these young plants that have less tolerance to herbicide. Uh, you can also uh, spot treat uh, blueberries uh, with post-emergent um, materials. Uh, keep in mind that uh, these post-emergent materials listed here are non-selective, so they, they will kill blueberries as easily as they'll kill uh, weeds. Uh, so take care in using those. Uh, during In these young plantings, you can also use uh, post and fusillade to uh, control uh, grasses. And of course, uh, cultivation is a, a pretty important tool for young plantings. So moving to established uh, blueberries, uh, the kind of workhorse uh, pre-emergent herbicides in Michigan for quite a few years have been uh, Carmex and Princep, Simbar and Solichem. Uh, there are other materials uses, used and a few new materials that have uh, uh, recently been labeled, but th these are the materials that are used uh, for the most part. Uh, we think of Carmex and Princep as being uh, strongest on broadleaf weeds and Simbar and Solichem being best on grasses. So growers normally are thinking about uh, using these in combination. So it might be uh, a Carmax with Simbar or Carmax with Solacam so that uh, growers can um, achieve uh, good control of broadleaf and uh, grass, uh, grass weeds. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, herbicide uh, resistance. Uh, not that it's uh, as big a problem in, in blueberries as it is in agronomic crops, but it certainly can and does uh, occur. So in avoiding um, resistance to herbicides, uh, the uh, key is to alternate or rotate between herbicides with a different uh, mode of action. And the, the important uh, thing to understand with blueberry herbicides is that there are four of the common herbicides, uh, Carmex, Princep, uh, Sinbar, and Velpar, that all share the same mode of action. So if uh, 
you develop a population of uh, weeds with uh, resistance to Princep, for example, that population will also be resistant to Carmex as well as Simbar. So it does you no good to rotate uh, between uh, Princep and Carmex um, in alternate years uh, because you're using chemicals with the same mode of action. Uh, fortunately, we have a number of different uh, um, herbicides now with uh, entirely different uh, modes of action. So you can choose um, herbicides, in a, uh, and I color-coded them here, um, with a, a wide range of different modes of action. We did a little bit of work um, surveying the blueberry industry in Michigan a number of years ago for resistance to the triazine uh, herbicides. So that includes uh, simazine and uh, turbis and uh, uh, velpar, for example, but it also includes the other photosynthetic inhibitors, uh, uh, Carmex and, and Simbar. And what we found was that there were uh, smartweed what uh, populations that were resistant in Michigan blueberries and very wide, uh, widely scattered uh, populations of mare's tail that were resistant to these triazine uh, herbicides. And I would suspect uh, there, there are more. We, we have uh <coughs> common complaints by growers about lack of uh, control of a number of the pigweeds, for example. But it's something to keep in mind uh, that over time, you don't want to stick uh, specifically and only with those uh, photosynthetically, uh, photosynthetic uh, inhib inhibitor uh, type of herbicides. And then post-emergent uh, herbicides, these are uh, several that are labeled for use in, in blueberries. And the key differences here that I think you should be um, aware of are whether they're uh, non-selective or selective and whether they're translocated within the plant. So Roundup and Touchdown, for example, are non-selective. It means they kill all, all things green. It, uh, they're translocated within the plant, which means that they're very effective <coughs> uh, weed killers for a number of different crops because the herbicide is moved uh, down into the roots of the plant, depending on when it's applied, and can control uh, even perennial uh, weeds as well as other perennial plants such as blueberries. A selective type of uh, post-emergent um, herbicide would be the, the uh, post-emergent grass killers, post and fusillade. So those have no effect on uh, broadleaf weeds, but they control uh, uh, grasses, and they are also translocated. And then there are another couple of materials, gramoxone and rely, which are non-selective, but uh, generally not translocated in plants. So that means that they kill the tissues that they contact, but they aren't translocated into other parts of the plant, and they aren't particularly effective in controlling uh, perennial weeds as a result. So um, all of those, with the exception of uh, the grass killers, can potentially damage uh, blueberries, which leads to the question of how you apply those without uh, injuring your blueberries at the same time. And there are a number of uh, approaches here. There are some shielded uh, hoods, such as these, this uh, product by Enviro Mist. Um, this is on a swivel swivel arm, so it, the hood can move uh, in and out between the blueberry bushes. Uh, it's uh, relatively slow uh, covering acreage, but for smaller plantings, I think it does a good job of keeping the herbicide off of the base of the, the uh, plants. Um, for these pre-emergent, or these um, perennial weeds that are difficult to control, I think a, a key time is uh, post-harvest. So after harvest, uh, we, these perennial weeds that are treated with uh, glyphosate uh, can easily be killed. Uh, the material moves down into the roots. Uh, this is when you can get a complete uh, kill of 
uh, perennial um, weeds, whereas if you treated those weeds in the uh, May or June as they're just growing, you may damage the top of the plant but not kill the entire plant. So this is uh, what I think should be a, uh, a common annual uh, practice once you get done with harvest is to spot treat uh, perennial weeds that you see in your planting. If you don't do this on a regular basis, so those perennials don't disappear, uh, they'll continue to grow and spread throughout the planting. Uh, there are a number of different uh, um, keys to this. Uh, first, apply late in the season. Uh, ammonium sulfate can be added to increase the penetration of the herbicide. But I wanted to, again, make the point that if you wanted to kill blueberries with uh, glyphosate, this would be the, a great time to do it. Uh, so make sure that you avoid contact with all green uh, blueberry tissues. Uh, that means the uh, leaves as well as the bark on those uh, one-year-old shoots that grew the previous year. So Roundup will be absorbed by this uh, tissue. The next uh, summer, you'll see the distorted leaves. If those uh, shoots uh, leaf out at all, uh, in many cases, they'll, uh, they'll be dead in the, uh, in the spring. So however, uh, whichever way you choose to use Roundup in the fall of the year, uh, make sure you're avoiding contact with any green blueberry tissue. In some cases, uh, here, here are a couple of uh, pictures of um, grapevine and then uh, wild blackberry and blueberries. It, this may require uh, pulling those weeds down out of the bush so that you can safely treat them uh, with Roundup while keeping it off of the uh, blueberry bush. Uh, mulching, I wanted to mention a few things about, uh, about mulching as a weed control uh, practice. It's not, uh, not wonderful. Uh, organic uh, mulches are costly to uh, purchase and costly to apply. Uh, and they have uh, other disadvantages in that uh, um, bark and wood chips are a, a great, uh, um, great site for um, various rodents. Uh, these um, generally do not prefer to uh, uh, chew on blueberry roots, but they certainly do and to some extent. The other aspect of uh, these organic mulches is that they don't control all perennial weeds. So eventually you'll have uh, perennials coming up uh, uh, through that mulch. We did a little bit of work uh, starting a couple of years ago with different mulch uh, types in an organic blueberry uh, project. And these are the uh, treatments, so some um, synthetic uh, uh, materials as well as uh, uh, burlap, uh, hay and straw, and wood chips, and uh, bark nuggets, and, and chipped, uh, uh, chipped wood. We have, uh, for two years, uh, um, taken a tally of the time required to uh, weed these uh, plots and then extrapolated the uh, um, numbers we got to a per acre basis. And if you do that, uh, what, what we found was that uh, with no mulch to keep those uh, plots completely controlled uh, of weeds, uh, this would cost about $1,500 per acre per year assuming that your weeders are paid uh, $10 an hour. And you can see as you go down, uh, down the list uh, uh, what the uh, annual uh, weeding labor uh, costs would be for you. Another approach to uh, weed management that uh, some growers uh, use is cultivation. So of course, uh, the big question with uh, cultivating between uh, uh, established uh, perennial plants is how do you uh, uh, disturb the soil without destroying the plants. And um, there's uh, uh, 
at least uh, one manufacturer of rotary uh, hose um, um, that's available uh, right now. There was what grower a number of years ago in Michigan that uh, managed all weeds uh, with uh, these rotary hose uh, on a 60 acre uh, blueberry farm and he would go over his acreage uh, uh, two to three times during the um, uh, season and he essentially had uh, um, high school kids uh, running uh, tractors all the time so the um, uh, rate uh, typically is about a half an acre per hour so it does take quite a bit of time but if it's a smaller farm smaller acreage perhaps this is a, an approach this is not a uh, entirely safe um, approach in that uh, you certainly catch blueberries occasionally. And then uh, lastly I wanted to mention something that uh, doesn't really relate to in row uh, weed control but it impressed me uh, quite a bit it uh, does relate to um, uh, vegetation management in the row middles. So in, in Michigan, it's common for uh, blueberry growers to seed annual rye uh, between the row middles in September. And then they may cultivate that or mow it or let it uh, uh, seed out the following uh, year. Uh, we were working in a organic uh, blueberry um, planting on, on campus and uh, cover crop uh, specialists uh, brought this uh, crimper in to run down the rows of uh, rye so uh, you can see this was uh, um, heading out uh, this crimper would move down um, knock the rye down and then it would crimp the stems of the rye so it wouldn't uh, stand back up so it's a little bit different than uh, just uh, rolling it down but the the neat thing about that was that we uh, crimped uh, the stand of rye in early June and then this picture was taken of the row middle in the middle of August so uh, um, over two months uh, later we're starting to get uh, some of those annual weeds uh, uh, breaking through the mat of uh, crimped uh, rye but I, I thought it was a neat system uh, and could work in an organic uh, uh, setting, but particularly for establishing new uh, plantings. I, th I think this, uh, I was pretty impressed with the amount of uh, suppression of weed growth that that uh, mat of rye uh, provided. So uh, that's a, um, about all I wanted to uh, cover, Laura. I, I've um, talked a little bit about the, the standard uh, weed management uh, systems and uh, and then a couple of uh, couple of newer things. I hope I generated uh, maybe some questions or or some comments. All right, thank you very much, Eric. And we do have some questions. Um, Molly Shaw asked um, for growers who mulch heavily with wood chip chips greater than eight inches. Which soil texture class would they use for herbicide rates? And that is a good question because that's something we kind of struggle with is trying to figure out with high organic matter. Yeah, that's a, a wonderful common question and I, I really can't answer it uh, uh, very well. There, there's relatively little uh, mulching in uh, uh, Michigan blueberries and I haven't done any herbicide trialing on uh, mulched um, settings. So I, I would suggest that you start with uh, a low end and do some experimenting with your uh, soil type and your um, uh, uh, mulch type and mulch amounts to see what uh, levels you need for, contr for control. Okay, um, Gary Phelps is wondering what rate do you need for Chateau on high mulched ground in blueberries? That may also be a challenge. <laughs> yeah, I, again with uh, Chateau um, if you were uh, mulching, you would probably need uh, a higher um, 
a higher rate than uh, um, than if you were not mulching. Uh, but I really can't tell you uh, what uh, control you'd expect uh, uh, from that. We haven't worked with it here. Okay. Um, we also have a question from Larry Flackus. He's wondering what the best control is for bindweed. Well, yeah, the two, uh, we have um, um, hedge uh, bindweed and the uh, common bindweed and Michigan blueberries. And uh, the control, uh, the only reasonable control of it that I've uh, uh, gotten is with uh, Roundup at the recommended uh, rates and recommended times. So when, when the vines are... Um, uh, flowering, they're uh, generally susceptible to to Roundup, um, and that's the only uh, no only solution I can offer right now. Okay, we have a couple of other questions about specific weed problems. Alan Baker is wondering what the control options for bishop weed or gout weed are. Um, <laughs> Alan, I'm sorry. I, I don't have any uh, experience with uh, uh, gout weed. Okay. Um, Gary Phelps is wondering about ground straw <coughs> and um, a control of ground straw. And I'm, I am not familiar with this particular weed, so maybe there's another name for it. We've had uh, reasonable control with uh, uh, Sinbar on... Uh, uh, ground straw. Um, it's one of those low-growing uh, weeds where I uh, question whether you need to control it entirely. Uh, if it's not up into the bushes, uh, perhaps it's something that uh, uh, you can tolerate. And then there's <coughs> another question from Jeff Miller um, about what are the manufacturers that are producing the wipers um, uh, do you happen to know, and maybe somebody else in the attendees <coughs> know, um, some of the manufacturers of herbicide wipers? <coughs> yeah, I haven't um, looked into wipers for, for quite some time. Um, I think I'd, I'd get on the web. Um, there are a number of different uh, types. We had uh, done some work uh, years and years ago with a hockey stip stick uh, type uh, uh, wiper. Uh, they they do a good job with Roundup, but uh, it's just so slow. It's it's hard to uh, cover much acreage with them. Okay. Um, <coughs> does anybody else have any questions that they would like to pose for either um, Hillary or Eric? Hillary says we use uh, wipers <coughs> quite extensively in cranberries, <coughs> so that would be great. Maybe Jeff and Hillary can talk about that. If anybody has any other questions, we'll move into the final uh, phase. Um, actually, there is one more question from Aaron Coates um, about controlling red dock. And, um, perhaps, uh, Eric, you have a suggestion for that? Um. Red dock, um, I'm thinking, might be uh, red sorrel. Um, if if that's the case, uh, uh, Casseron uh, provides uh, a reasonable uh, control of uh, of that. And then there's a comment by Marvin Pritz about why don't more people use wheat straw as a mulch since it's easy to acquire. Maybe there's some feeling about that. I, I always thought that um, straw would draw some bowl and mold problems and that uh, that was a reason to discourage its use, but it looked really like it might do an effective job as a, as a mulch there, so that was interesting. Yeah, our experience with it, it smothered weeds uh, uh, wonderfully. Um, it uh, requires higher nitrogen uh, rates if you're uh, using that, but I, I agree. I think it probably has uh, utility. It doesn't have the um, longevity, perhaps, of uh, some of the uh, wood 
uh, materials, but like you say, it's uh, cheap and available. Right. Um, I, I do want to draw everyone's attention before they start logging off. We don't have any other poll questions, but I want to make sure that you see these uh, file shares here for folks to uh, download to get more information. I also want to, um, one of the attendees drew to my uh, attention that I did not uh, introduce Dr. Hillary um, Sandler, and I apologize for that. That is my mistake, but I really appreciate her um, uh, patience with me, and for th I'm glad we got her connected because that was a great presentation. And Dr. Eric Hansen, I really appreciate your presentation. And I do want to remind those of you who did not send me registration information but got uh, the logon connection information from someone else, please email me. Uh, I'm just going to type my email address um, into the uh, chat box here and just send me your postal um, address, your email address, and your phone number so that we have that on record. And at this point, unless, oops, there's one more question. Why um, establish an annual cover crop between rows? And I think that must be for you, Eric. Yeah. Well, the um, there are a couple of, of approaches uh, here. There there were a number of um, growers in the state that used perennial sods uh, and and blueberries and. Over the last several years, they've gotten away from those because they tend to attract uh, Japanese beetle. So the Japanese beetle uh, females lay eggs inside, and so that increases that uh, uh, that problem. Uh, growers also like uh, bare uh, soil in cold areas because it uh, uh, tends to be a little bit warmer on those frosty uh, spring nights. So I think in in Michigan, where if it's um, a frost-prone area, uh, bare soil um, in the spring is uh, um, appealing. All right, great. Thank you, speakers, um, Dr. Sandler and Dr. Hansen, again. I do want to remind folks that you, um, now that you're all registered, you will be receiving connection information for all of the future Barry webinars. The next webinar on our docket is on Wednesday, November 18th. It's actually a very important topic. Um, we're going to be talking about cranberry and blueberry disease management. Um, Dr. Frank Caruso uh, from the Cranberry Station at U University of Massachusetts will be talking about cranberry viruses and Dr. Annamiek Schilder will be talking about blueberry viruses and for uh, both cranberry and blueberry growers, these are very, very serious and important disease problems, and I encourage you to attend and tell uh, other um, growers the same about this uh, this program. All right, that's it, and thanks again for attending, thank you. and uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. I don't know if I'm still here or not. Hi, Hi Hillary. I oh, do hear okay. you still. Yep. So I saw that Jeff still had a question. I don't know if he's still on. And he might be. And I was just trying to type um, my answer, but maybe we can both chime in. It, did, it does seem to me that most of the Michigan uh, industry... That's what I would think. Is yeah. That yeah, I think so. Too. I think Maine is primarily yeah. the only place that's doing low bush. But Eric Eric chopped off already, so he probably would have been the best. Yeah, I, I think I think Maine is. From my um, work trying to get some statistics for the berry crop, it pretty much the high bush blueberry was New Jersey and Michigan, and then Maine was all low bush. But yeah. Well, well, thank, thank you. you. It was really, it was a, a great experience, and uh, now I'll remember next time to select microphone. <laughs> 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 and uh, and you said that these will be um, archived.
someplace and you'll let us know they will yes i'll send you the link it's on the cornell berry um website and uh we have three of the four strawberry mm -hmm. ones up now and i'll try to send this out as soon as possible so that it will be and then you could just put that link right into some of your cranberry that's girl great information and so that they that's can get awesome. right to it and um yeah and the nice thing especially about yours is they don't they can go and listen to your presentation and if they don't grow blueberries they don't have right. to listen right. to that i'm not so sure yeah the blueberry growers i think you kind of have to listen through the whole thing in order to get to it i'm not positive that they can kind of fast forward uh, or not, okay i guess we'll find out okay <laughs> That's okay. I think it'll be. Oh, fun. so it'll yeah. actually Thank be you so very much. today's webinar. So mine is is linked to Eric's, so they would have to listen through mine to get to his, or what? Okay. Yes, uh, we. Okay. Yeah, which I think it'll be. Okay. It'll be okay. I I think people will actually be really interested in mm -hmm. hearing about cranberries. You know, most of us sure, don't know much sure. about it, but. That was a great well, presentation. No problem. Well, yeah. I think this has been a, a great, you know, I'm, I'm glad the Northeast IPM is supporting something like this. I think this is a great thing. And I'm, I'm going to try to chime in on or listen to the disease one on the 18th. That sounds great. So I will I will register. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks. <laughs> All right. You take care. <laughs> I can register you. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Take care.